Coming up today on Locked On Texas Tech, one single thing the Red Raiders must do if they hope to have a chance to get a road win in Fort Worth this weekend. You are Locked On Texas Tech, your daily podcast on the Texas Tech Red Raiders. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Great to be with you again on Locked On Texas Tech on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day, always free and available on YouTube or anywhere you get podcasts. And thanks as always for making us your first listen. Today's episode brought to you by FanDuel. Place your first $5 bet and you'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. So visit FanDuel.com to get started. With the only Chris Level, I'm Casey Cowan. Chris, great to be back with you as we begin to set our sights on the frogs of Texas Christian. Red Raiders are Fort Worth bound coming up this weekend for a Saturday afternoon matchup. Want to get into a couple of different things on that front with you here today, including some of what we anticipate we'll see from the Horned Frog defense, courtesy of offensive coordinator Zach Kitley. We'll get to some thoughts on him. I want to get to a new wrinkle for the Red Raider defense that we now finally saw come to fruition last time out against the Baylor Bears. And uh, want to kick off our conversation zeroing in on one specific area that looms large for obviously any matchup. But the turnover battle, particularly for Texas Christians so far this year, has loomed just about as large as anything that they have had going on. I had to rub some sleep out of my eyes, double check, triple check when I'm looking at some of these numbers because I swore this couldn't possibly be true. But yes, it is true. Giving it away 15 uh, times, taking it away only five times so far this year. That's a margin that's not going to get you very far uh, very fast. And, you know, we come into last week talking about what I think it was nine takeaways for Texas Tech over the previous four ball games. Feeling decent about that. And it was my fault for saying that out loud because then you go goose egg uh, last time around against Baylor. This is one area in particular that you have got to flip the script in a matter of seven days on, right? Because if you can't take advantage of this, it kind of feels like you may have a very difficult time winning a ball game. Something te Texas Christian has been susceptible to so far this season. We want to continue that party coming up on Saturday. <laughs> yeah, I mean, every coach goes into every football game saying you got to win the turnover battle. We we got to be on the right side of that. Turnover margin is going to be key in this one. And and yeah, so th that's captain obvious. Uh, that that is goes for any coach at any level, uh, and, and all those things. This has largely though been TCU's problem. Uh, they have turned it over alarmingly uh, uh, high number. Uh, and, and just to put some of this into perspective, I mean, a team has recovered one of their fumbles in five of their seven games. Uh, all six interceptions have been thrown in three of their last four games. Uh, and and I, I would just, you know, without trying to simplify too much here, if you can't get into some of these takeaways, you will not win on Saturday. That's the, been the recipe. That's when you're at your best defensively. You know, we, we already know you're, you're not the 85 Bears. You're not stopping, uh, you know, shutting people down and all those things uh, and, and not going to do it for 60 minutes. But when you sprinkle in some turnovers and and you, you are opportunistic, I think things get pretty fun on, on that side of the ball for you. And obviously your offense has been able to, you know, I think take advantage of some of those opportunities because they get real aggressive. And we've seen some of that complimentary football happening whenever you do get the takeaways. Uh, but, I mean, sh sh short of, of winning the turnover battle here, I mean, that, that's the simplest way as you can look to, to this weekend and, and figure out whether this is going to go well or not. Because TCU, again, they've just had a hard time holding on to the, uh, the old pigskin. Uh, and, uh, I mean, yeah, it's a minus 10 overall. It's basically minus, you know, o over the course of the season, it's basically comes down to like, you know, you know, one and a half a game. They're on the wrong side of it. Uh, and on average, which is not good. And so, uh, that, that is something that you've got to figure out ways to, you know, punch it out, uh, catch catch one of Hoover's passes or three, you know, whatever it may be, 
and and see what life is like that way because that's your recipe for a win here. And that's been what TCU's biggest problem is. TCU is interesting the way their roster is built. They have they have probably recruiting wise they probably have more four or five star players on their roster than anybody in the league. Uh, they have a lot of speed uh, and, and all that, but it just hasn't really gelled and, and clicked uh, in a lot of cases this year. But so much of this has been self-inflicted with the turnovers. You know, mm-hmm. they just can't get out of their own way. And, uh, and, and it makes football really hard. And like last week, they were able to survive uh, getting one of their field goal attempts blocked. Uh, on the road, which you rarely win a game when you go get a field goal attempt blocked, and it was a fairly short field goal at that. It was early enough in the game where they were over, able to overcome it. But yeah, the, the turnover thing in most games is, is paramount. In this one, I'm not so sure that it doesn't mean everything. Uh, and if you can't take it away some, you're going to be in trouble. That's that's how I would view it because this is TCU's biggest problem. And if they come in and play a clean game against you, they're either getting it fixed or you're just simply not not good enough to cause them problems, and both would theoretically be a problem. Yeah, and unfortunately for Texas Tech, I mean, one of those things that seemingly goes hand-in-hand hand, uh, with creating some takeaways, uh, forcing turnovers for an opposing offense, not so much in the fumble column necessarily, but in the interception column, is pressure in the quarterback. And raise your hand if you're tired of talking about this. Uh, oh, wait, no. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to raise my hand. Um, Texas Tech not doing that so far this year. One of the worst examples of not doing that is the Saturday that we most recently experienced uh, against the Baylor Bears. And I don't know exactly that there's any kind of quick fix, but we talked about um, on yesterday's episode, you know, whether or not you're going to try and be a little more creative or you're going to put some more pressure on the secondary to cover because of the additional numbers that you've got to – got a throw at the opposing backfield, but uh, rinse and repeat. This is the conversation again. This is the conversation for almost as long as the uh, forward pass has been a part of football. Uh, If you can get after the quarterback and uh, speed them up, put them in some bad situations, they're more prone to to make some mistakes. And so I'm hoping that if there is no other priority defensively, Chris, and again, just from a fan's perspective, that's what I would want the conversation to start with this week as far as game planning is how in the world do we come up with some way uh, to try and get after the quarterback? If nothing else happens, uh, I feel like that would have to be number one on the list. Yeah, and this is one of the – Josh Hoover statistically is one of the top passers in the Big 12 and in the country. Uh, they they throw for – this is almost like the old Mike Leach stuff. Not, not schematically, but statistically it is – they just kind of token run it uh, or have. Uh, he's not really one that's going to burn you with his legs, but they get the ball out quick. They've got a ton of folks to throw it to that make plays after the catch. But you, you're playing with fire if you can't if you can't make him uncomfortable uh, at all. And it's tricky because, you, you know, I, I think that most people go into games going, you got to pressure him. And then he's been able to burn some of the, the folks doing it. So, It'll, it'll be an interesting kind of chess match uh, on Saturday afternoon. If you blitz, you know, if he finds it or, or is able to find somebody in, in man-to-man coverage, there may not be a lot of help over there if they make a play and, and away you go. I mean, you just kind of live with the, you know, live with the consequences. But because what, what is really ultimately what's really frustrating here is when you really can play good defense – and that's going to be the ultimate goal for everybody is when you can rush four and and pressure the quarterback and then you can do everything else that you want to, but you're just not, you're not there. Um, I, I, I looked this up to be sure, but I told you this before the show, it's fairly sobering that TCU has more sacks seven in their last two games than you have all season with six. That's the reality of it. I mean, TCU has, I think, 17 tackles for loss in the last two games combined. And yeah. and so they are able to, you know, and they take a lot of chances. And I think sometimes that does burn them. And I think that's why they've given up a ton of explosive runs 
uh, as well because they blitz, they blitz themselves out of, of things. And if you are able to, to make them pay, look out. Uh, but, you know, I think that's one of those things where you've just simply got to figure out something where you can uh, create some sort of pressure on Josh Hoover. Uh, otherwise, that you're not going to like the results. And the playmakers that he's got and Jack Besh, Savion Williams and J.P. Richardson, you know, that, that's that's not a – so those guys are so good. Are you comfortable enough putting those guys and, and putting your guys out there in man-to-man and, like, going, okay – Let's 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 use some of our resources here and let's let's pressure it. Let's make something happen. And maybe you do that some. I don't know if that's smart, but you're going to have to figure out something there uh, to to utilize, whether it's, you know, a a fifth guy or a sixth guy or a seventh guy on occasion uh, to try to get him uncomfortable. and Maybe he'll throw it to you, you know, but but that's the reality of kind of how how much they are pressuring the quarterback and then how you are really, really struggling with it right now. If you're going to continue to sober me up so much, I might as well (laughs) at least get drunk prior to the show so that I can put it to good use. I'm tired of these sobering facts. I'm sober as a judge. So like a cold shower. Well, you know, and again, just, just trying to paint the picture so people can understand. That's crazy. You said in the last two weeks, They've got more than we've got for the year. Against Houston and against uh, Utah, they have seven sacks total, like three in one game and four in the other, and you have six on the entire season. Insane. And God bless those fine folks at the Ronald McDonald House going hungry this year. We're trying to raise some money. They do the sack challenge every year. Pretty light in the seat so far this year. Um, let's get to something that is a part of that effort for Texas Tech. Kind of got maybe lost in the wash because of the overall result on Saturday. First, today's episode brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. And when you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. And that's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. And they're not just another job board. LinkedIn has a vast network of more than a billion professionals, which make it the best place to find the right hire. Gives you access to professionals you can't find anywhere else. And LinkedIn does all that while making the process easy and intuitive for you. Hiring is easy when you have that many quality candidates to choose from. So easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within only 20 four hours. That's lightning fast. LinkedIn is constantly finding ways to make the process easier as well. They even just launched a feature that helps you write job descriptions, making the process even easier and quicker, plus more effective. So post your job for free today at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free today. Terms and conditions apply. We finally got a peek at John Carlos Miller as a defensive player. Um, We've been talking about this over the last few weeks, changing uniform number. Okay, what's going on there? Um, You know, is he going to get an opportunity to try to play some defense? Coach McGuire alluded to some punt coverage, I think, a couple of weeks ago, like he's going to be on the field at the same time, Uh, yada, yada, yada. And then we finally see it come to fruition that he gets uh, a few defensive snaps and Coach McGuire talked about earlier this week wanting to ramp him up uh, for a few more. Specifically, he mentioned third down snaps defensively, but this is one of the more curious moves we've seen made so far this season. And I don't know if it says more about, you know, what you need as far as a pass rush, if it says more about maybe what John John Carlos Miller can be as an athlete, some of all of the above, but uh, how far back does this convo stretch, Chris, kind of, internally behind closed doors and um what, what do you think it actually does suggest that they were actually willing to make this move with a guy who had been fairly productive uh, just as a tight end early on in the season i think uh i think your your all the above answer is probably the right <laughs> one i think that there's a need i think Clearly. that you you want to get your best players on the field and I didn't even know this, but Joey said uh, earlier in the week that this is something they kind of either talked about or experimented with back in the spring. But uh, it is something that they've started to practice in the last two to three weeks. And, you know, we mentioned this, you know, when it happened in the game, uh, we mentioned on the broadcast on Saturday that 
Joey had said uh, that, you know, we gave him three or four reps or whatever it was on the, you know, in the middle of the week in one of the live periods. And he got like, he got to the quarterback like two or three times out of the very limited reps that he had. And they were legitimate. It wasn't like, yeah, he probably would have gotten there. No, it was like he was there. And I'm not, I would not rule out, which is kind of what we hinted at on the broadcast too, is that I wouldn't rule out that this will not only continue, but I, and I, I, I don't know what to think about this, but I mean, I guess this is what he said. And so we relayed it on the, but this is something that it, could there be a position switch in his future, like in the off season. Uh, I think they feel like internally that the upside is tremendous and he's got the measurables for it. And there's potentially a lot more money for him to be made if he can perfect this craft. Um, you know, we, we, we touched on that on like what the, what, what usually goes in the top of the draft, uh, you know, I think earlier in the week and it's either, it's either QB, it's, it's the folks that protect uh, the, the edge player or it's the edge player. That's kind of what you see at the top end of the draft. Not that we're talking about that with him here, but um, yeah. And so uh, I, uh, and, and, I, and he has to have set a record for three different numbers in three straight games. That has to be a record for <laughs> yeah. a tech player. Cause what was it? It was at nine. Then it and was 27. A, 27. And then he's at what now? What was 18? I think. 18. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's hard to keep track of everything. But I guess he's going to stay at 18 now Um, because originally, and that's what we reported on the broadcast, I guess, when we we were in uh, Tucson, is that um, they wanted to use utilize him more on special teams. And they there's times when he and CJ Baskerville are on the field at the same time. We can't do that. So we got to switch numbers and and all that. But now this is a completely different deal. And he did play. Uh, he rushed the pass for a couple of times uh, versus Baylor, and he does get up the field quick. Now, what he's going to have to work on is being a complete player, you know. Uh, and and do you are you just tipping your hand when he comes in there? Now, at some level, maybe you don't care because he's only coming in and, and passing situations to where it's it's third and long. And so, yeah, we don't, you know, of course we're sending our our cheetah package or whatever you want to call it with uh, your, your, your pass rushers and all that stuff, but pretty fascinating situation there. I've never seen this before, but they're trying to find an answer. And, um, you know, I think it speaks to the lack of pass rush that you ultimately have right now and trying to get one of your best guys in his skill set onto the field uh, because he does have some juice and you're trying to, let it work for you a little bit. And then I think it will continue. Yeah. I was going to ask about uh, any previous comparisons over the years that you could recall to a move being made like this. I kind of remember, I don't remember if it was so on the fly as this feels like, but uh, uh, Kenny Williams went from running back to like outside linebacker for a period of time. It seemed like then he went back to just being a running back, but that's a uh, shoot. That's a decade ago, I guess, or over a decade ago. Uh, I don't remember many or hardly any <laughs> where this is actually taking place. So it should be interesting to see play out. And um, I think again, speaks a lot to what they're trying to find as far as some help in that area. Uh, let's stick with the defensive theme, but uh, switch to the people in purple because I, I really don't have a good feel for Texas Christian, not only this year, but, I'm kind of thinking like identity as far as their program is concerned, Chris. I I guess I'm still sort of stuck in the the Gary Patterson era, which has been a little while now. It's not like it was just yesterday that that was in place, but always viewed Texas Christian as somebody that's going to have a great defensive game plan, was going to be a really tough and physical team. They're going to knock the snot out of you, and uh, they may not always be a team that was – um, you know, all that prolific offensively, but again, just a great defensive game plan. And that's something that they had to rely upon. Um, under Sonny Dykes, I, I can't say that from a program perspective, I have a great feel for what I feel like their identity is. And then this season, just for this team, I don't have a great feel for what they are. I mean, the Houston game stands out, what it had been eight quarters or something like that without a point for the Cougars. And then uh, they go there, and I think it's like 16-point underdogs. They're able to get a win. It's just kind of been here or there. Do you think that they, either this year or as a program under Sonny Dykes, and that includes a run to a national final, of course, 
do, do they have an identity? Is there something that is sort of their bread and butter, like maybe defense used to be whenever Patterson was on the sideline? You know, I don't think they do, uh, which is probably part of their problem. Uh, I think that they've been so transfer heavy that and he switched up his coaching staff uh, a bit because in their national title run, Garrett Riley was the OC and he was very highly coveted and and got a big bag to go to Clemson to be their OC. And so then you bring in Kendall Bryles uh, to kind of spread it out, which is a, such a strange dynamic. But, I mean, heck, Gary Patterson also worked for Baylor. So it's just the whole thing is like makes my head explode. Uh, as I can only imagine what the conversations were with, with the people internally on both sides of that deal going, so he's working for us now? Like what, what? I mean, cause I mean, th- th- these were the, 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 you know, they hated the, the Art Browse, Gary Patterson stuff back with TCU Baylor when they were both rolling was just ugly and, uh, and it was nationally relevant, but, um, so they they haven't but back on topic they had they they've switched up their staff and then they had Joe Gillespie as their coordinator on the defensive side during their title run and then last year it kind of it fell off the map a little bit uh, but after Gary Patterson had ran the four two five I think Joe Gillespie brought in like and was running the three three five I think is what it was. And, and then you have, and then they they move on from him. And Joe Gillespie's now a uh, head coach in Waco. Ironically, uh, he's uh, I think the head coach at Waco Midway in in Waco, Texas, at the high school level. And so they bring in Andy Avalos, so who whose scheme is basically like, yeah, sure. Uh, it's just like a little bit of everything. Uh, they don't really have a base. Uh, maybe he would answer that differently, but I think everybody else talks about it being. Uh, you know, multiple, um, and that they are all over the map. They blitz a lot more than normal. But as far as just general identity, right now, I would tell you that it's a, they're a throwing football team. Now, is that the way that this program is going to be built for years to come? And is that going to be their staple? I can't say that. But right now, that's what this particular team is because that's what they're the best at. Uh, because what I'm used to is is a TCU team that runs the football so well. Like with NFL type backs, you know, I mean, they they uh, they've always been a very balanced, very fast football team. I think they still have some speed, but they have really struggled to run the ball, and that's also something you can pay attention to. I mean, they they are like I think ninety second or ninety fifth in the country at only like only rushing the football like a hundred yards a game. Mm. The, the, and, and last week there they've got Savion Williams, uh, which is one of their stud wideouts. They hand it to him like seven times and let him run it out of like wildcat stuff, just to try to manufacture some touches for him and r- manufacture some running game. So yeah, it's like takeaways, and if you can't stop the run, you know if, if they're gashing you, then that that's because they haven't been able to run it hardly on anybody. Um, but that's what I was just so used to is that they used to be very balanced and they throw it, you know, have more passing yards than, than, than running. But this is a team that was, you know, averaging close to 200 yards a game on the ground used to not, not too long ago, like namely their, their title run here uh, with Ken, Kendra, Kendra Miller, Kendrick Miller, I think uh, was his name. So as far as identity this particular year, yeah, I, I think it's, I think it's get the ball out quick. Uh, we're going to throw it. We're going to throw it more and we're going to keep throwing it. We're going to put pressure on you and we've got players that can make a variety of plays. And so we'll kind of see what we get on Saturday, but that's kind of what you see with this group so far, but it's been very different than I think what we've been used to seeing with them. Yes. Well, and really curious to see defensively, as you talk about the, the variety uh, I guess that we can expect yep. to see on Saturday, maybe what that looks like. And uh, Texas Tech offensive coordinator Zach Kitley uh, spoke uh, this week about that multiple approach. First, today's episode brought to you by FanDuel. And NFL fans, you can start this season with a big return on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Say you're watching a game, you get hit with a hunch, an instinctual calling. Well, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, and so much more on the same page where you're going to place your bets to keep up with everything going down in real time as you submit that slip. And right now, FanDuel is going to get you started with $200 in bonus bets 
guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. That's right. $200 in bonus bets guaranteed with only a $5 bet out the gate at FanDuel.com. Defensively, as you talk about the the variety, uh, I guess, that we can expect to see on Saturday, maybe what that looks like. And uh, Texas Tech offensive coordinator Zach Kitley uh, spoke uh, this week about that multiple approach. Yeah, they're all over the place, man. Uh, about every front you can think of defensively, they play every coverage. You know, not a whole lot of tendencies. Um, they're everywhere, you know, and so they, they've got some good football players. They fly around, uh, you know, like they've been getting after the quarterback uh, a lot lately. You know, I mean, they they beat up the, the young guy there at Utah this last week, played. I mean, they're playing really good defense right now. You know, I think they've uh, they do quite a bit defensively. And I think, you know, you see early in the season, they were kind of trying to figure out some of that stuff. And you saw some more of the explosive plays happen early. And uh, I think they're getting they're getting more settled in and more confident in what they're calling defensively now. And the players are confident and they're flying around making plays. So. We got to come up with a great plan, and, and again, you know, I got to get the quarterback settled in early, and and you know, again, they're they're going to move around and do a lot of different stuff. So we just got to we got to be ready for everything. It's kind of crazy to consider you move on from such a stalwart and Gary Patterson, you wind up in a national championship game, but uh, I think it may be still a bit of a struggle to try to figure out what you want to be as a program, sort of akin to what you move on from uh, here in Lubbock, whenever Mike Leach leaves campus, you have such a specific kind of vision that had been entrenched for uh, a decade. Again, there's a little different because you wind up competing for a national title, uh, almost as soon as he is out the door, but, um, you know, quite a challenge to replace a guy that that's been a fixture like that for so long and get right back to have something that you do, having something that you do really, really well. And, and I agree with you as far as not just the defense, but the offense sort of going back to that, that physical personality. That's just the way I've always viewed them. And uh, it kind of seems like they've gotten away from that a little bit, whether to their detriment or not. I don't know. Um, but I guess we'll find out coming up on Saturday. Yeah, you know, and, and and what you'll get with their defense is that I do think they are getting better, which is not ideal for you. And that's what teams do is they typically progress and you you need your team to, to get back on that on that same train uh, where you're, you know, we're developing guys and we're getting better as we go and all that. That's the goal. But I just, you know, as I mentioned to you, seven sacks and 16 tackles for loss in their last two games alone uh, total. Uh, and so they are maybe figuring out, you know, cause some, some would say like, okay, what is their base or what is their scheme? Well, when you, when you hear Kitley say uh, little, everywhere, some people will say, man, if you're not really good at any one thing, you're, you're just kind of spinning your wheels and it's a grab bag, so you don't have a chance to get good at any one thing. You're yeah. just kind of a master of all, master of uh, everything, you know, or, or jack of all trades, master of none. There you go. I spit yeah. it out. Uh, it took me a second. But, uh, <laughs> but, but what, you'll see, what you'll see with Tech's offense against this is you'll see – the, the chess match to where they will tackle you for two or three yard losses, maybe multiple times. And then you'll see, hopefully you gash them for 17 or you hit them for, for something. That's kind of the, the way TCU has been. They're giving up a lot of chunk runs because their aggressiveness and maybe they start to settle in here. Maybe they'll, they'll start to get away from, from that as they get better and have a better understanding of what they're trying to do. Uh, but uh, but that's what it's been like, you know. So and and, and text challenges, you got to stay patient, you know. Stay patient. Don't get away from what what ultimately you believe will will, will eventually work. And you know, because it's easy to get greedy and try to force some things, and that's when you get in trouble and uh, the, the potential turnovers come or or whatever it may be. But uh, but they they will their aggressiveness will hurt them as much as it will help them, and you just need it to be the uh, be the, be the first part of that, uh, sentence right there, because they're going to get you some, that's just the way the scheme is set up. They're going to load up and, and Baron can't make the right check every time, but it puts a lot of pressure on, uh, on an offensive line and a quarterback trying to figure out, okay, what front are they in? Who's coming? Who's not? What, what, you know, um, and it's all pre-snap versus post-snap and, that's why, you know, hopefully there's a lot of study and going on leading into this game and, and things like that. So, uh, yeah. but, you know, you, you may get some some tackles for loss, but hopefully you get some some uh, chunks uh, as well. But uh, we'll see. But that's kind of what they that's kind of what they're doing right now. A little bit of everything. Uh, before we get out of here, 
if I could take you back to last week prior to uh, the ball game in Lowick and ask you, which of these against two in-state opponents would you rather have? You got the Frogs on the road. You got the Bears at home. Is it an easy choice for you? Um, is there one you would have rather had over the other? And, of course, we're involving some hindsight here now in our experience against Baylor. But uh, what do you think? Does one mean more to you than the other? I dislike uh, both programs greatly. Um, maybe it's, uh, I'm not really fond of green or purple. Um, I grew up in Fort Worth. I got out as quick as I could. I hope my parents aren't listening. I I, I do. (laughs) I do. I love them. And it's a, it's a great city. I just don't like the, um, I just, a lot of, there's a lot of TCU crossover, uh, and all that in my family and all that. And I, 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 that answer for me is fairly easy. I would probably always say TCU. But I, I gather that of the of the current Big 12, I'd be willing to bet you that most Tech fans would say that they want to beat one of these two schools the most over anybody else. And Oklahoma State may factor into that equation a little bit. But I just – you just gather – that like TCU and Baylor kind of get your dander up a bit more uh, th- th- than others. There's some, there's all the crossover with the coaching staffs and everything, the personal and all the stuff from Baylor. I mean, heck, you took the, you've got a basketball, uh, you know, guy that went to, uh, was on the staff at Baylor too from your basketball with, with Grant McCaslin and, and all that. So there's that aspect too. But football, it's like, okay, th- there's been some, there's been some smack talk. Uh, the ADs have even tweeted and, there, there's ticket gate going on. There's the hit, <laughs> hit, hit in the toad crap that it's gone on. There's a saddle involved. Uh, but I, I, I'm curious, like, what do you have an answer for? I mean, t- to me, um, it's TCU, but I, that I'm probably slanted in my view of it. Where, whereas other people may have their different view, but I'm curious what you would say. I, I do want to always beat the in-state programs the most, uh, compared to the rest of the league. Um, Program to program, I don't know why, but I would rather beat Texas Christian than Baylor, I think. Um, and I do have some family crossover myself as well, so there's some annoyance. Some of them will be out here to uh, hunt mule deer next month, so I'd like to have this one in the bag by the time they get here so I can just be talking <laughs> crap the entire time. But um, I, as far as matchup this year, I would have preferred, if I could have only had one, to keep intact what you were doing on your home field. And to reward all the fans that are showing up in your stands for a game on your home field. So that slants it a little bit towards Baylor as far as just the circumstances in 2024. But I, I don't know why. Maybe it's the purple. It's just the purple. I can't stand it. Uh, <laughs> or or black. Christian. Yeah, black. I don't know if you've heard this or not, but, you know, horn, horn frogs can shoot blood from their eyes. Or so I have heard say. that, yeah. So they say, yeah. That's what Who they knows? say. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Let us know what you think out there. If there's one over the other you would have rather had if you could only – choose one and to be fair both of these teams have been really good in recent years now baylor has hit the skids a little bit and and whatever but i mean both of these schools have won the big 12 conference in recent time frame uh they've both you know they've both done some serious damage uh and that's partly why it's it's fun to beat them and you have struggled during some of these same time frames but um i guess point is is if you go win this one on Saturday, you know, you have a chance to feel just so much better about life in general <laughs> and about, oh, we, we, we got we got one that, that really mattered kind of thing. To your point earlier in the week about maybe it's good to go play these guys and do it in the ro- on the road and, and, and all those things. Yeah, so, some opportunity comes with yeah, um, sure. opportunity to uh, bounce back and uh, regather some goodwill from your own fan base, which is always an important thing. Uh, Chris, appreciate the time as always. Give me a heads up if we're going to need to uh, get ready for sobering facts on the next episode. I may just kick <laughs> back a few so it'll be of good use, but uh, looking forward to it. Uh, enjoyed it, and we'll see you for the next one. You got it, man. Keep hope alive, everybody. And get subscribed on YouTube or anywhere you get podcasts so you never miss an episode. Thanks especially to those everydayers out there for being there uh, every day. And a special shout out to the Matador Mobsters as well. If you want to get down with the mob, your direct line to Chris and myself, check out the show notes for the link where you can try on a free 14-day 
trial. One of the best ways to help us grow the show is to comment anything below. So thanks to those who are mixing it up in the YouTube comments section. As always, for Chris, I'm Casey. Thanks for the time. And we hope to see you back for the next round on Locked On Texas Tech.